Welcome everybody. Welcome to this session. My name is Sally Crow and I will be um, chairing this session. I'm a Cochrane consumer and I have an interest in how the public get involved in research and evidence development. So this session is about better health decisions and about using Cochrane evidence in shared decision making. So it's now widely accepted that shared decision making um, between patients and clinicians should be embedded throughout healthcare services. Um, and it can be thought of in terms of drawing on three elements, um, the evidence, the clinician experience, and the patient preferences. Um, and Cochrane has uh, identified its users of evidence as consumers and those seeking to make healthcare decisions such as their family, patients, families, and carers, the public, and of course, practitioners of healthcare. So first slide, I think, uh, Richard, this, this um, session will then explore how Cochrane produces that range of evidence for the public and healthcare professionals from our Cochrane reviews to our evidently Cochrane blogs, podcasts, etc. cetera. Um, and then in terms of, um, we want to think about how that's used by consumers and the public, either when making treatment decisions or clinical decisions. And crucially, whether there's a gap between what we anticipate as the ideal of shared decision making and what actually happens in real life. And can we bridge that gap? So we hope by the end of this session that you're going to come away feeling informed and stimulated about shared decision making and Cochrane evidence and the interplay between those two by presenting different perspectives and experiences. So before we start, we just want to find out a little bit about you and apologies, I know you've already done this first thing this morning, but it just helps us enormously in the panel to know who's here and how we pitch um, the session. So you'll see a poll coming up very soon. If you could um, click on that um, in terms of who you are and then the um, team will know a little bit more about um, you. And whilst you're doing the poll, um, we're going to introduce the team. So first of all, we have um, myself, I've introduced myself. Then we have Richard, who's the consumer uh, engagement officer for Cochrane. Um, then we have um, Kit, who's a former consultant general physician and geriatrician and a very active member of Cochrane. Then we have Tracy, who many of you will know is the director of the Cochrane Campbell Aging Partnership and is currently co-chair of Cochrane's governing board. We're then very blessed to have Helen Bulbeck with us, who's a member of the Cochrane Consumer Network Executive and Director of Services and Policy at Brain Trust. Uh, we then have Brian Devlin, who's a Cochrane UK consumer champion. Um, and uh, we also have Emma with us, Emma Doble from Cochrane, who's more in the background and behind the scenes. And between myself, Emma, and Marta Santos from Cochrane, we will be managing the questions and comments as they come in uh, following the presentations and uh, panel discussions. So that's our panel for today. Uh, and the way it's going to work is that we've got several different types of input. We have some narrative stories, um, we have some presentations and we'll pause after each of those for a few minutes to take questions uh, for the speakers uh, and then we'll move into a final conversation at the end of the presentations where we will take um, questions from you. Um, I think you've hopefully already seen how it works from this morning's plenary session, but when you want to pose a question or make a comment, um, then you use the uh, labelled live Q&A tab, and that's where you input your questions or comments. And you can vote for other people's questions and comments. In other words, you can upvote something. And Emma um, and I will try and get through those questions first, um, uh, and, but hopefully we'll reach all of them in time. During the session, because it's very content rich, um, Emma's also going to post in the, um, sort of chat function, uh, resources and links for information that will take you to more, in, to more content from our speakers, which I think is terrific. If you want to save that, we suggest you copy and paste it and put it into your session notes option, which again is on the right hand side of your menu. 
finally, um, for those of you that are on Twitter and maybe talking to people who aren't in this session today, um, you're welcome to tweet about this session. Just to remind you, the hashtag is hashtag virtually Cochrane. Uh, and then that other people can see what you're feeling and, and thinking about of this session. Now, in terms of the poll results, um, I haven't seen those yet. We have 47 people who voted in the room. And so far, we have about 40% researchers, um, some healthcare professionals, um, some consumers, and then quite a large blob of other. Welcome all. I've just repeated that, not for you, but for our panel who are in a separate um, platform and can't see those results. So that just gives the panel members a little bit of feeling for who's in the room right now. So I think that's all the um, domestics done for the session. So I'd like to hand over to Richard, who's going to lead us into the first part of this uh, workshop. So I'll hand over to Richard. So thank you very much, uh, Sally. That's, um, that's great to be, uh, to be speaking next. So just to introduce myself, um, again, I'm Richard Morley. I'm the Cochrane uh, Consumer Engagement Officer, and it's my privilege to support uh, consumer involvement and engagement uh, with Cochrane Evidence. And by healthcare consumer, uh, uh, we mean patients, carers, uh, and the public. So Cochrane produces its uh, evidence uh, for a range of audiences, healthcare professionals, policymakers, researchers, and for patients, carers, and the public. So I'm delighted to be able to introduce um, our next item, which is a pre-recorded presentation by Karen. Uh, Karen's a volunteer for Cochrane, um, she volunteers with the Common Mental Disorders Group, and uh, she's going to, in this pre-recorded uh, presentation, describe her real-life experience of using Cochrane Evidence uh, with her GP, uh, where uh, she, um, in com conversation with her, uh, reached some decisions about uh, her treatment with her GP. So the presentation is uh, sorry, five minutes long, and you might be interested to know that the, the cartoons that uh, are illustrating her presentation were also drawn by uh, Karen as well. I hope you find it an interesting start to our discussions uh, about shared decision making. I think it sets up the rest of the content uh, perfectly. So if we could play the video, that would be great. This is a story of how I used Cochrane evidence for myself and had my first experience of real shared decision making. I've had contamination obsessive compulsive disorder since I was an adolescent. But I only lately found out what it was when, while caring for my mother who had dementia, I had a particularly unpleasant episode and searched for my symptoms online. I know all about the importance of reliable sources, but I wasn't at my most rational and I plunged headfirst into the sea of Google. I read indiscriminately and it confused me and made me anxious. I had a sense of stigma about taking medication for mental illness and I was worried about side effects. I was interested in talking therapies especially cognitive behavioural therapy with exposure and response prevention, CBT, ERP. Yet some online accounts of it alarmed me. My first encounter with a GP was short and I don't recall much discussion. She handed me the phone number for increasing access to talking therapies, IAPT, and told me to refer myself. I agreed with IAPT that I should try counselling first, but there was a waiting list of at least six months. So I tried a private counsellor without success. She didn't challenge my fear of ERP, and she told me an anecdote about a relative who hadn't tolerated medication well. Luckily, I knew about Cochrane. I knew that the systematic reviews in the library would be reliable, free from vested interest and regularly updated. That was what I needed to escape the confusion, the anecdotes and the emotion. 
Again, I was lucky. I found two systematic reviews that were just what I was looking for, one on medication and one on psychological treatments. They told me SSRIs, a type of antidepressant, were more effective than placebo, a sham treatment, in reducing symptoms in the short term. They worked. There were possible side effects, but the risk for common ones in fluoxetine was low. Psychological treatments derived from cognitive behavioural models were more effective than treatment as usual. So they worked too. The second review mentioned another on behavioural and cognitive therapy. It was for OCD in children and adolescents, but it said OCD was similar in children and adults. It suggested that neither therapy nor medication was superior, but there was evidence that combining both treatments produced better outcomes than medication alone. Armed with this information, I made up my mind to discuss it with a GP, so I asked the duty doctor to call me. Yet again, luck was with me. Psychiatry was his particular interest, and he was very sympathetic. He asked me what I already knew about the condition and its treatment, and I told him about the Cochrane Reviews. I wasn't prepared for the response. He perked up instantly and looked twice as energetic. Then for the first time in my life, I experienced true shared decision-making, and it was tremendous. I felt like a partner in the consultation. We discussed the potential benefits and risks of medication, the dosage, the side effects, and what we could do if I couldn't tolerate the treatment. He showed me where I could find more information online. He turned his computer screen towards me and talked me through things as he looked them up. We agreed that I should try fluoxetine and also call IAPT again and ask to be moved onto the waiting list for CBT ERP. We discussed my circumstances too, and what positive steps could be taken to help my mother and me. So he skillfully and sensitively brought together what I already knew, my needs, preferences and circumstances, with the current evidence and his own expertise. He helped me to feel in control of the process. This continued in the appointments that followed as we adjusted the dosage to suit me. What a positive and empowering experience it was. Now I'm a confirmed fan of health evidence and of shared decision making, and I'd like to urge you to try it. What an engaging and thoughtful um, contribution from Karen. Um, I'm struck by the fact that she has a proper BBC voice, I think, and should definitely branch out into audiobooks and uh, cartoons. Um, how gifted is that? Um, really helpful, I think, to hear um, this first-hand experience of meshing Cochrane evidence and sh um, with sh her shared decision-making. And we can all thank Karen for sharing this sort of very personal story. As Karen isn't here to take questions um, today, by all means post um, any observations and comments in, in the function provided and we can get them to her after today. And also please post your reactions um, to what she said and we can maybe return to some of those later in the session. And before I just hand over to our next contributor, I just want to pick up a point from Christine Mills, who said that in the poll, um, we've had to choose one thing. And of course, we all have multiple roles. So thank you, Christine, for um, uh, reminding me of that. So um, we're going to move straight into the next session, and then we'll take a, a break for some questions. And it's going to be um, Kit, who I introduced at the top of the session. So I'm now going to hand over to Kit, who's going to take us on a sort of whistle-stop tour of the theory and thinking behind shared decision-making and, and, um, and how it can be used. So Kit, over to you. Thank you, Sally. Why am I here? I'm not an academic. But as a geriatrician, my effective working depended on advocating for my patient and working with a first multidisciplinary team. Being active on Twitter has kept me involved with medicine since my retirement from the NHS. 
Today I'm offering a personal history of evidence-based medicine and shared decision-making in two papers, four books, and a blog. The first paper is uh, an editorial from the BMJ from 25 years ago by David Sackett, the grandfather of evidence-based medicine and his colleagues. It sets the scene. It's entitled, What Evidence-Based Medicine Is and What It Isn't. The first paragraph reads, it's about, well, you can read it for yourself. And he goes on to say in subsequent uh, text that this is in relation to the patient. Indeed, the patient is mentioned 18 times in the text of that editorial. So this establishes the now eponymous EBM triad of David Sackett with three components, the best evidence, a wise clinician, and the patient's unique needs. So you'll see in that triad that there are three dyads, and I'm going to look at these in turn. Firstly, evidence and the clinician, which brings me on to my first book I'm referencing, which was by Tricia Greenhalgh, academic GP, How to Read a Paper. And this was originally a series of papers in the BMJ uh, in the mid 90s, subsequently published as a book. And many, many uh, clinicians have used this in, in decoding the evidence. The second dyad, uh, having established that the clinician is engaged with the evidence, uh, brings me on to my second book, which is Rethinking Causality, Complexity and Evidence for the Unique Patient. And this is a, a philosophical look by a group of philosophers at the philosophy of causation and the paradox that there, there can be in reconciling evidence based on groups of people with how it applies to the unique patient in front of one. So there's a two-way street between the patient and the evidence. The patient may need help in decoding the evidence, but also the evidence may need uh, adjustment for the unique circumstances of the patient. So this brings us on to the third dyad in the patient and, cl and the clinician. In other words, the consultation. And here is the blog. This is a blog called Mind the Gaps by Trisha Elliott, whom I met on Twitter. And uh, this, this uh, blog is linked in her pinned tweet. It examines the three gaps that she identifies in, in, the, in the consultation from her own experience on both sides of consultation. The three gaps are the knowledge gap, the, if my clicker will work, the, here we are. The knowledge gap, the power gap, and the arousal gap. We discussed the knowledge gap in the, uh, the preceding dyads, but the power gap and arousal gap are not about the cognitive aspect of the consultation, unlike the knowledge gap, they're about the affective or emotional component. And uh, the, the emotion, problems with the emotional component can impede and will impede good communication, which brings me to my third book in the series, permitting, uh, which is a book, again, written by Trish Greenhalgh, remember an academic GP, and Liz O'Riordan, a consultant breast surgeon. And this, they, they both received a diagnosis of breast cancer and have vividly described the impact of, on them of receiving this diagnosis, and both initially being unable to engage cognitively and apply their faculties to the issue because of the affective impact, the shock. So uh, the book is an, an excellent example of combining evidence, expertise and communication and was partly crowdsourced by, in, by questions and suggestions and information from pe people living with breast cancer via Twitter. So what's the remedy for all this? Well, this brings me on to my fourth book, Uh, which having dealt with the, the consultation affective aspect, the solution I suggest 
best is comes from this book, Compassionomics, if you can't read the text. This is not a touchy-feely, feel-good book, but it's written by an academic intensivist and a chief physician responsible for patient safety and patient improvement in a US hospital. That's business. And this is all about the science of compassion. And it is a treasure trove of, of data with abundance evidence showing that compassion improves outcomes, improves patients and relatives experience, even if there are poor outcomes, saves money, reduces complex litigation and staff burnout, and signally for this particular presentation, helps to build trust. And the book explains the science behind this. So if one has, if one can bring compassion to the part, sorry, to the party, then one can hit the sweet spot in the middle of the EBM triad. So um, this brings me to my second paper, which in the context of current, of course, is a systematic review. And of uh, several thousand papers were richly screened, 18 papers were included from a variety of countries and contexts, some disease specific, some population specific uh, variety. And not surprisingly, they identified that the barriers to discussing information obtained from the internet in the consultation were largely affect. And uh, so the barriers were concerns about how the physician would or the clinician would react. Uh, if there was resistance from the clinician uh, to discussing information adduced by the patient and the understandable fear of embarrassment. This is not rocket science, these are all human experiences that probably many, if not most of us, have had. What were the facilitators? Uh, clicker permitting, I will share that with you. Here we are. Again, having support from a trusted person, having a doctor who encouraged the person to uh, explore these options. And in countries where advertisements are allowed uh, for treatments by companies, advertisements which recommended this approach of just talking to the doctor. So I suggest that all this can be summarized in an equation. Uh, and the equation I would suggest that the EBM triad, when combined with trust, allows co-production. If you prefer it graphically, then I would put it here. The EBM triad of compassionomics data gives you a rather complicated diagram, which I will enlarge for you and finish on. And we can have this in a much clearer form. But the cogs of EBM, when bathed in the oil of compassion, allows a much better function of the engine. Thank you. Thanks, Kit. Um, thank you for that tour of um, the theory and your thinking behind the concept of shared decision making, which is our topic for today. And I'm really conscious that you put an awful lot of work into that presentation with all your book citations and whatnot. So thank you for that. Um, so whilst people are, are sort of digesting a lot of what you said, because there's a lot of content in there, I just had one um, question, which was around this idea that we deal in IQ and EQ, intelligence and emotional intelligence. And um, I wonder how you think we can equip the healthcare system to better undertake that emotional intelligence work, as well as the skills of using evidence when making shared decisions. It's about the culture and there's a lot of communication skills training done in medical schools and postgraduate training in, in medicine and other disciplines. Um, it's some things can be taught. Uh, some people are brilliant at it naturally. Some people are not very good at it, but learn. And there's a range of people. There's a range of consultation styles and communication styles. So I don't think one can, it's a complex system and there's no simple solution for any complex system. Mm -hmm. But I think empowering patients 
teaching doctors how to encourage patients. And in fact, uh, I, I didn't mention, but often the knowledge gap is, is a negative one in the sense that a, doc, a patient with a long-term condition, particularly if it's rare, may know much more about that, that condition than the clinician. And I've certainly learned a lot from several of my patients about their conditions from them and their endeavors. They have a vested interest mm -hmm. in getting the best information and getting it right. Mm -hmm. So if we can see it as a partnership rather than as a father-child uh, relationship, uh, um, adult adult rather than uh, uh, in Eric Burns games people play um, if, if if one can work together and not be egotistical or, or uh, pompous um, even when one tries to be to flatten the hierarchy there's going to be a power gradient there patients know that and as as the compassionomics data shows if you share openly and, uh, and show emotional intelligence then the trust will develop so okay. it's a two-way thing. Thank you, Kit. And you can see now all the panel are on screen. And I'm just going to take this opportunity for, to ask Brian to introduce himself as the uh, panel member who isn't doing a presentation today. And I wonder, Brian, I'll throw the rope to you in case you want to ask Kit anything before we move on to the next bit of content. Sure, yeah. Thank you very much, Sally. I'm Brian Devlin, and I'm one of the consumer champions for Cochrane UK. Um, I thought it was a fantastic presentation, kept really moving and made me think a lot. Um, I, I, like you, I'm on Twitter a lot, and um, I don't think I'm on quite as much as you are, but I'm, I'm on it a fair bit. Um, the, the, I'm, I'm struck by the role of doctor patients, doctors who are also patients, and you brought that up in your presentation. I think there really is a, a, an immense role there, isn't there, in, in conveying uh, what, you, what you were saying. Uh, totally. I, I, and it's something I've, I've advocated for a while that, that maybe this is a, a vinegar of resource that we should should employ. I, I mentioned in my bio that I was the dementia leader in our trust for, for nine years. Three years after I became, dement, um, became uh, dementia lead, my mother was diagnosed with a rare form of dementia. And I followed her journey alongside her as a, as a son but at the same time being a, a clinical lead on dementia in another hospital. And I found, I found the power gradient difficult and, uh, to negotiate. I, uh, I didn't want to go in and, and push my weight around and say, I, I'm, I'm a dementia lead. Um, I, I just introduced myself as the son of the patient most of the time, um, unless there was a critical or safety critical thing that I felt I had to bring to someone's attention. I, I subsequently gave feedback to the trust, measured feedback, based on my experience and observations which they valued um, so being a, being able to see things from both sides of the fence is quite different from having seen thousands of patients on one side of the fence thank you thanks brian and thanks kit so we're going to move on to our next presentation which is from tracy howe who many of you know uh, 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 from Cochrane. So we're just going to change the screen somewhat to Tracy's um, slides and Tracy, you're going to take it away for us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sally, and um, good morning to everyone. I'm so pleased that you're able to join us today at this uh, exciting presentation, uh, part of the Virtually Cochrane uh, event. Um, I've been given the task of um, saying how Cochrane evidence can support shared decision making. And <clears throat> I think uh, it's really important to say that, um, as you can see on the, on the screen, Cochrane's strap lines are trusted evidence, informed decisions and better health. And so informed decisions is very much part of Cochrane's mission um, and integral to everything we do. So um, I think it's really important to uh, understand how uh, Cochrane evidence can be used in that way. So next slide, please, Richard. So the, the first thing um, in terms of uh, evidence that Cochrane produces, as you all know, are the systematic reviews. And if we look at the Cochrane Library, where all of the systematic reviews um, are hosted, um, you can search for these reviews um, by topic area uh, and a number of uh, other ways. So the Cochrane Library it would be your first port of call for any evidence. However, the 
systematic reviews are written in a very uh, academic language. Uh, they're very complex and often very long um, and involve a considerable uh, methodological jargon, uh, which for many people make them un <clears throat> unintelligible. Um, and so, uh, Richard, if we move to the next slide, um, each one uh, has a plain language summary, which helps to make the information contained in the review uh, more uh, informative and understandable for many other groups of people. So Cochrane is a charity uh, and as a charity our objects are about improving health um, but our beneficiaries are the people receiving health and health care. Um, so it's very important that the information that we provide is available not just to clinicians who are making decisions uh, from a clinical perspective, but important for uh, patients and users of health systems to be as informed as possible when they're involved in discussions with their clinicians about um, the decision making for their care. So plain language summaries are available for all of the reviews. And next slide, please, Richard. Um, and here's a, an example. Um, and often they contain um, an audio uh, piece as well. And they're written in uh, many different languages. So if you look at the top of the screen, uh, you'll see that there are a number of different languages in which the plain language summaries are available. So if English is not someone's first uh, language, um, there are many different ways to access that. Next slide, please. Another way of um, translating the Cochrane evidence into more uh, manageable information is through the use of clinical answers. So here the questions are uh, mainly questions that would arise uh, in a, um, a decision making process uh, for clinician and patient and the questions there pull information sometimes from multiple reviews um, and provide the information in again a more accessible way. They're slightly more complex than the um, plain language summaries uh, but they do provide uh, additional information and again um, these are often available uh, in different formats. Next slide please. Other things that, um, that Cochrane evidence can help with um, are special collections. So here's an example um, looking at physical activity for healthy aging, an area close to my heart. Um, and uh, this brings together um, sort of summaries of how to find the evidence from the Cochrane Library uh, in broader topic areas. So often these special collections are developed for certain um, events uh, and activities um, such as um, World Cancer Day um, and uh, obviously the COVID pandemic. So they're quite an easy way to access broader groups of information. Next page, please. And um, as people have been talking about Twitter uh, and various other ways of disseminating information, uh, Cochrane UK have been uh, forging forward on this for a number of years. Uh, Sarah Chapman um, is uh, fantastic at sharing information in accessible ways. So evidently Cochrane is a blog which takes a topic area uh, and puts that information in a broader context and pulls information in from uh, different sources and provides the Cochrane evidence for this. Um, next slide, please. And blogs, blog shots are, are very useful for sharing um, the sort of headline information uh, that can be used again for um, clinicians and patients and uh, many other uh, uh, audiences. Um, these are really simple. Uh, high uh, informative pieces of information that can be shared very easily on social media. So this is using the best evidence to um, disseminate the information to the broadest audience in accessible ways. And 
I think that's my slides complete, Richard. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks for taking us uh, so nimbly through the range of Cochrane evidence that can play a part in um, shared decision making. And I think keeping us in the here and now with your COVID examples has been very um, helpful. Um, uh, Dashka Trivedi has said that the Cochrane Nursing Group produces review summaries in Cochrane Corner for nursing journals, and these are very well received by health professionals who deal with patient care. I have one question from um, Karen Ganey, who says, my PhD thesis is on plain language summaries, yay! And I see great potential for their use in shared decision making. They can help, with, uh, they can help improve health literacy and empower the public. What do you think about that? Oh, plain language summaries are fantastic. Um, I think, uh, you know, that when I first was involved in Cochrane, we had uh, the abstracts, uh, and then we moved to plain language summaries. Uh, but often plain language summaries weren't really plain language. Um, and I know that a lot of effort has um, been taken forward um, to really um, actually make the information in as plain language as possible, uh, whilst maintaining the quality of the evidence and information that's available for the decision making. So uh, fantastic um, on your PhD topic area. Um, I think that that will make a substantial uh, contribution to the evidence base in this area. And uh, I look forward to seeing your findings being implemented uh, in Cochrane um, evidence in the future. Thank you for your question. Thanks, Tracy. There's a couple of comments and questions in the um, chat that I want to hold back to the main conversation when we've finished all the presentations. So if, you, if I haven't mentioned your question, um, I will be coming to it in about 10 minutes time. Um, so I think in the essence of time, we better move on to the final presentation. So thanks panel. Sorry, we didn't get enough, quite enough time to go through all of your views on Tracy's um, presentation, but I think we'll move on to Helen now. Um, and Helen is going to move us from Cochrane evidence right back to patients and families. We're going back to the beginning where we started with Karen. Um, and Helen is going to um, just share with us some, pers some perspectives that she has uh, in her role as um, working for the Brains Trust. So Helen, over to you. Thank you very much, Sally. And I'm so delighted that Richard actually started um, by sharing Karen's story. I felt very privileged to have heard that because I don't, you know, we must never underestimate the power of the narrative when it comes to patient stories and building a case for transformation. And that's what I'm going to talk about today is Andrew's story, because there isn't a story to be told without the patient. And I think, too, it's very important to remember that before we're patients, we're people. And if we're treated as people in the consultation room and in conversations, then we're much more likely to feel more resourced, but better able to face the challenges that being diagnosed with illness this brings. Um, you know, so we do have to look beyond the genotype and the value the patient brings into the consulting room and understand that it far exceeds the purely clinical. And we know now that research shows that patients who are supported in shared decision making, so they're navigated through it, attribute much more knowledge and understanding of their diagnosis and their treatment, so they feel much better able to cope. We know too that they're less distressed um, and due to being better informed. They feel prepared and I, I run a national brain cancer charity and I know that if we navigate patients and coach them through that they're more likely to go with question lists. We know that they have more focused consultations, but they also broke broader in scope. And I know, too, that patients we support can manage their transition points better along their journey. Next slide, please. So this is Andrew. Andrew's a patient I'm supporting at the moment. He's been diagnosed with a glioblastoma, which is the, the worst kind of, of diagnosis. It's life limiting. He's probably looking at nine to 15 months. Uh, brain cancer of this aggressive type is the most common form of cancer in, in people under 40. His whole life has been turned upside down. The weft and warp that he's built over the last 42 years has been completely torn apart. And his challenges are just huge. He's got the disease trajectory, so he knows that as time goes on over the next few months, he's going to have progressive neurocognitive and neurological decline. He's got this heavy symptom burden that he's carrying. Um, he's got the pressure of teleological time, the thought that time is running out for him, lack of support. He's geographically removed from his family, isolated from his immediate family. He's living with uncertainty, um, often in a high state of emotion, which means he's not able to think clearly or respond or react in a way that's appropriate. And if we could go to the next slide. 
if you look at his care pathway, every single engagement or interaction that he has when he's engaged with his clinical team is, is purely about, is about treatment. There is not much space for Andrew and Andrew's voice on this, this pathway. Um, and so I think this is the gift of shared decision making is it enables us to create the space to talk about what matters to Andrew. Um, and the closest he'll get to this conversation at the moment is probably filling in a patient concerns inventory with his clinical nurse specialist. And all that is actually doing is um, reminding him of the losses that he's had, of the things that he can no longer do. If we could go to the next slide. So what we're seeing and what we're encouraging certainly our community to help with is making that shift from what does the average patient need to know to what does this particular patient need to know and understand so that they're able to make the best of the resources that they have around them and we're encouraging our patients to grow this conversation next slide please and the way we do it um, is by using um, coaching and coaching techniques and very simply if you were to say you know that 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 elevator pitch what is it we ask questions um, and I think the role of shared decision making questions sit beautifully with this because the goal is to ensure that every person who needs and wants it and we have to understand that actually not everybody wants to participate in shared decision making um, but has access to the type of discourse I outlined here and this is the zeitgeist we know that it drives involvement in care, it improves quality of life, it creates better outcomes for people, and it also saves money. But to deliver this is a very big ask. You need prepared patients, trained teams and supportive systems, and we all have to work together on this. Um, so we need to be investing in the capacity of patients to create value in our health systems. And we find that coaching really helps here. It creates shift. It moves people from being out of control to taking charge. It creates resourcefulness. We know that, for example, carers are better able to support more effectively and it creates resilience as people are better able to face things. And certainly within my organization, it's really useful for us because it means we get closer to our users. It creates a more meaningful dialogue at every touch point. Every time we email or we pick up the phone, we're in coaching mode. And this creates clarity and purpose for the patients and the carers. And it also creates a structured framework from which we work. So I know that the quality of the conversations that my support specialists are having are, are, to, are gold standard. But mostly we ask questions. If we could go to the next slide, but not these simple questions. Um, we always avoid why questions. It puts people on the defensive. We use what and how, unless it stems from genuine curiosity. So I wonder why. I wonder why you reacted in that way. Um, I wonder why you felt that your GP wasn't listening to you. And we know that questions open the door to dialogue. They creativity and breakthrough thinking. They lead to movement and they generate insights and they ignite change. But we tend not to ask the right questions because in the Western culture in which we live, we tend to focus on having the right answer, not the right question. And between our deep attachment to having the right answer, any answer, and our anxiety about not knowing and be comfortable in, with silence, we've thwarted our own collective capacity for deep creativity and fresh perspectives. So if we could go to the next slide. So these are typically the sort of good questions that we ask. And even asking simple questions such as, what does all this mean for you? What haven't we thought of that could make a difference? Um, can really create shift and move a patient on. So we, you know, we know that powerful questions, they generate curiosity, they stimulate thoughtful reflection, they lead to reflective conversation, um, and they can surface underlying assumptions too. And they will stay and they will travel well with the person that you're talking with because they touch deep meaning and often they'll evoke more questions. And then my final slide. So you cannot not communicate. And if you could do one thing, just show a curiosity. Politeness is good, but curiosity is better. And I, you know, I think Kit listed one of the, the things as being the doctors um, it, being able to initiate an inquiry. 
So if you take one thing from this talk today, just ask one question and that's what are you struggling with the most? It's the one we ask the most and don't be afraid of the answer because it's not our role to fix it. Just asking the question is shared decision making at its best, it's patient centred care and it will elicit unmet needs, it shows empathy and understanding that you're listening and that you care. And where would this leave Andrew? Just somebody stopping him in a corridor and saying, what are you struggling with the most? Would elicit from him what matters to him, what his values are, what his context is, what his appetite for risk is. And that would be a transformative conversation for him and also for his clinical team. It would place him as a co-pilot in his care, trust levels would be high, and he'd be regarded as an asset in his own care with his own sense of resourcefulness and range of capabilities. So we need to combine a person-centred process embedded in shared decision making so that quality of life and care become just as much as a rich scene as a research for a cure or a quest for a cure, because that's what matters to Andrew. And there's a link there where you can learn about um, conditions, hear others' lived experiences, learn about shared decision making and how to find help in making decisions. So thank you for listening me, to me and for your time today. Thanks, Helen. I could feel my heart beating through that presentation. I could feel your passion. Thanks for taking us in such a sort of thoughtful and insightful uh, look at the inner workings of the patient and family journey from the perspective of brain cancer diagnosis. I love your good question side. And despite my excellent cancer care, I don't ever remember being asked one of those questions at multidisciplinary team meetings or, or clinic appointments. So that's made me think. So we have the panel all on screen now, and uh, we've had some really great feedback on the um, chat functions. Um, and it's time to consider some big questions. And I think the biggest question that's coming through, apart from the very positive affirmation for Karen's um, opening um, narrative, is one around inequalities. And there's several starred questions around this, and I'm going to read them for the purposes of the panel, member who, panel members who can't see these. So they're both from Anonymous. The first one is, how can we ensure solutions aimed at increasing the use of evidence in shared decision making don't inadvertently increase inequalities we see in society? I can see you're all making notes there. Um, and then a follow on, and it may be from the same person or it may be someone different, is how do we specifically reach patients? who are disadvantaged in several ways, such as health inequalities, research literacy, socioeconomic, and may not be able to advocate for themselves in a shared decision-making process, especially for those who are unlikely to know where or how to access our evidence, as in Cochrane evidence. So I'm gonna throw it open to the panel and I'm wondering, um, perhaps the best way, yes, if you wave to me and then unmute, and then we can respond to those really excellent questions. Thanks, Kit. Uh, very pertinent questions, not least in the, in the uh, as we heard in the, the evidence about the pandemic, it took time for different effects in different pe uh, sections of society to become apparent. I think one of the big things uh, in this is is the internet itself the social media and uh, and resources like cochrane and other lab resources have allowed or are, are allowing should i say the democratization of information and uh, another book that nearly made it into my list but because of time limits didn't uh, is the book invisible women uh, which documents the history of omitting women from medical, scientific, social studies, uh, and, and until now, really, uh, in many cases. And I think by, by alerting people to these gaps in evidence base, bases, uh, the, the democratic pressure will uh, encourage scientists to focus on the the, the higher hanging fruits, not obvious simple questions, but the more uh, more nuanced uh, questions of which which subcategories. So that, that's about awareness. I think awareness is increasing and it will continue to increase in the nature of, of the beast, as it were. And it's our job as advocates, health advocates, uh, to make sure that that happens. And public health is by definition political. One can't have views about 
health and the health of the public without having views about how that's achieved. And it's only achieved through political action, really. I'll, I'll stop there and Thank allow you, Kit. someone else to comment. Thanks very much. Tracy, you want to say something? Yeah, I think it's um, that's they're really good points, Kit. Um, I think um, access to information has never been easier for the vast majority of people. However, uh, that also comes with risks um, because access to information doesn't necessarily mean the information is appropriate. And so, you know, we have misinformation as well. So we do have challenges there. Um, I think the access to information being easy is fantastic because um, not only do the uh, patients themselves have access to this, but their family, friends, broader communities also have access and have different levels of understanding and may be able to bring that information together collectively um, in preparation for decision-making, uh, debriefing on decision-making, et cetera. Uh, but I think the important thing here is about, you know, the evidence needs to be trusted evidence, and that's really where Cochrane does make a valuable contribution. Thank you, Tracy. Does anybody else want to make a comment on? Yes, Richard. Hi, uh, thanks very much. I, I think those questions about um, that, that, that were posed uh, really get to the heart of what Cochrane is about. Really, and I'd like to uh, say a word, if I, if I may, about about the way that we produce our evidence. And, and um, uh, Helen said something about being about patients being co-pilots in, in in their care, and, and I think I think that that idea of uh, making sh making sure that when Cochrane, when other people too, uh, produce the evidence that we have, that it's produced in partnership. Uh, with patients and carers as well. And um, to make sure that we're asking the right questions, the things that are important to people, uh, to make sure that um, for an organization like Cochrane, that we're asking questions that don't embed health inequalities globally as well. So that we're making sure that we represent you know, the majority world and not only asking questions that are about first world medicine. Um, that we answer, answer the questions in the right way so that we're actually properly addressing patients' concerns, the things that are important to people, the things that are important to Andrew in, in, in that, in that uh, presentation from, from Helen. Uh, and uh, that they're presented in, in ways that are accessible and imaginative ways. Um, plain language summaries are, are great. There are other ways too that we could, that we could do. And I think we could be more imaginative about the way that we present our work. Uh, and I, I, I just want to say something about um, we've talked about uh, empowering people. Um, I'm not always sure about that word, empowering, but I do think this is something that Cochrane and others could do more uh, to help people um, with that process of, of shared decision making, giving people the information, knowledge, skills. Uh, we have a resource called, uh, 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 well, we have created a resource for patients and learning results which explains uh, about our evidence, but there's a lot more that we do in partnership with other organisations as well. Yeah, that's it from me. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, I just want to read out a couple of comments from the uh, participants. So, Dachka. Trivedi says, in terms of um, BAME COVID risk, community champions have a role in demystifying fears around what evidence is conveyed, which I think is a fantastic point. I think the danger as an evidence producer is to think it's all our work to get those messages out. And it's actually much more about partnership, isn't it, and working with other groups. Um, does anybody want to say anything on the inequalities question before I move on to the next one? Because we are, we just have a few minutes left in this time for conversation. If not, I'll move on to the next question. No, okay. So this one is really interesting. It's from Debbie. Uh, Debbie Smith, thank you for your question. And it's saying, how do you alert people to systematic reviews, get ready for this crunchy one, that give outdated information and recommendations? So, so far we've had lots of positive examples of information to support shared decision-making, but what if it isn't there in terms of the, the actual essence of the evidence itself? Because we can't spin out of that, 
you know, or can we? So that's the question I think. So I knew Tracy would put her hand up. So, <laughs> okay, if I'm gonna take on that one. Okay, thank, thanks very much for your question. And I, uh, I absolutely agree that, um, you know, we don't get everything right, um, you know, and that's part of uh, um, everything, but I guess it's part of admitting when we're wrong. I think one of the big criticisms of Cochrane is that it takes forever to get information out and for reviews to be produced. Uh, we are addressing that. And as you can see uh, from our response to the COVID pandemic, um, we produced information very rapidly, uh, high quality evidence that has uh, been utilized in decision making and policy making around the world. Um, and so we can do it. Uh, it is a bit more resource intensive and the governing board are uh, very um, much in favour of looking at how we can streamline our processes to make that evidence uh, available more quickly to get to the right people at the right time. So I can assure you on behalf of the governing board, we are working on this. Um, uh, but as you know, things take a bit of time to, to alter. Uh, however, we did respond uh, fantastically well, and I, I would like to congratulate all the teams and everybody who was involved in, in that and are still involved in that. Uh, they've done a fantastic job. Um, so um, we'd like to take that learning and move it across the organisation. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. I think that's, that's, a, that's a really helpful answer. The last thing I want to throw at the panel, and I'm particularly interested in Helen and Brian's response to this, if somebody's come through with, I think something that Kit was talking about, and also I think Helen, you touched on in your presentation was, how can we get physicians to have a less paternalistic attitude towards patients? Light touch paper, walk away. Who wants to go first? Brian, I think you're, are you reaching for the... <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a very, very important question for me in particular. Um, I think, uh, again, I do think that barriers are being broken down through social media. I think that there is a great engagement of biomedics on Twitter and and that does help because people like me who are, I'm a theologian, I'm not a, a scientist at all. So, I mean, I've been able to, and I'm also a patient. So I've been able to engage on, a, on an equal basis, actually. Somebody mentioned the democratization, I think it was Kit, of Twitter. And I think that that is not the answer to the question, but I think it's a start. Yeah, and for me, I think it's it comes back to the patient story, but it is about building a library of, of stories where patients can show the difference it's made and how it's brought them on. But equally, um, only yesterday I was working with a, a group of clinicians from um, Southampton University Hospitals, and they are now taking it trust wide because they because they've seen the impact it can have. And I think it is grassroots. So it's working with that critical mass that want to take it on board. You're not going to convert everybody. Um, you know, the holy grail for me is getting clinicians to see that it isn't just one consultation where the patient's saying, well, what are my options? What are the pros and cons of each option for me? And how can they, how can, where can I find help? That it is a seamless thread throughout the whole of the patient care that needs to be in the DNA of the organization. And it, yeah, it's going to be a long time before we get there. But I think if you could just start with that very simple question what matters to you? What are you struggling with the most? If every clinician could ask that question of their patient, I think it would completely change the discourse. Thanks, Helen. That's a really, really excellent place, I think, to finish the conversation. And I think probably addresses a point that Catherine Dean made along these lines that around effective interventions can be scuppered by poor communication or, um, as she's put, arrogant, dismissive or rude um, relationships between patients and health professionals. So I think there's a really positive way of, of reframing that. But thank you, Catherine, for that point. And I hope that was that was addressed by Brian and, and Helen. I'm um, sadly we've reached the end of our session. So I've got a few notices to tell you before you go away to the next thing. But first of all, I want to thank our speakers who've put an enormous amount of preparation into their presentations. Um, and I want to thank the audience for staying with us and having such good points and questions to make. And just in terms of housekeeping, there's now a 15 minute break, um, followed by what's called a social lunch at 12.30 with nine topic rooms. So if you fancy having a social lunch, have a look at the topics and you may see some familiar faces in there. 
after lunch there's an opportunity to meet with project representatives or funders and the meet the details for these meetings will be in the timeline just click on join and you can also browse the project hub and find out about more about the featured projects each project has a little video with more information about it if you want to watch this session again if you're a, a glutton for punishment um, these will be available later on um, in, on the platform today um, and we look forward to seeing you for more live presentations at 2 p.m but just finally thank you so much to our wonderful panel um, who've shared and cared and really worked very hard for this session today so thank you very much and i think it's now officially 12 15 so we say bye bye thank you <laughs>